Uh, good afternoon. I always like to hear Greg's red meat speeches, uh, you know, the, otherwise known as, as, as the fire stump speech. Um, it's truly inspiring and depressing uh, at the same time. Uh, I can't say that I'm going to lower the temperature, uh, but rather I'm going to switch to perhaps uh, a more analytic and pro professorial mood. Uh, Greg and I don't disagree on many things. In fact, we agree on more things than we disagree with. But I thought I'd just give you one, in, one indication of where we might disagree. I, too, wrote about the guy who said, anyone uh, who can blow up the Pentagon has my vote. Do you remember when he said that or in what context? In a classroom. In a classroom on September 11th. Th then he should have been fired uh, <laughs> immediately uh, because he was then engaging in political activity in the context of a classroom uh, space which was paid for by the state or, or by the trustees of a private college. Uh, and so he had turned the classroom into a theater for his political views. And that just crosses a line. When you do that, you're no longer an academic agent. Uh, you have become something else, a political agent, and therefore you deserve no protection of any kind. So that just uh, sets a parameter that we might uh, later discuss. Debates about freedom of speech often proceed without any inquiry into what exactly speech is and why we might be committed either to promoting it or constraining it. This is a large question or set of questions and I won't be able fully to answer it today, but I can make a beginning by recalling for you some of the observations Thomas Hobbes makes about speech in his great book, Leviathan. Hobbes says two things which are in tension with one another. Early on, he says, and here he follows a very long philosophical tradition, he says that the capacity for speech is what distinguishes us from animals. Human and animals, he goes on, quote, share the senses and the natural instincts, but by the help of speech, these shared faculties may be improved to such a height as to distinguish men from all other living creatures, unquote. However, when later in the Leviathan, Hobbes returns to speech, he identifies speech as a capacity that enables us to be duplicitous, deceptive, destructive, and even evil. Then he says, although, our, although other creatures have some use of voice, I am quoting him, yet they lack that art of words by which men can represent to others that which is good in the likeness of evil and represent evil in the likeness of good. So speech as a capacity and as a form of action is a leading character in two narratives. In one narrative originated, originated by Cicero and other classical humanists, speech is the deliverer of civilization. It's the faculty that allows us to formulate plans, recommend policies, urge actions, rise to life's challenges, coordinate our efforts to better the human condition. In the other narrative, a negative one, speech is the medium through which we deceive our wives and husbands, manipulate our fellow citizens, betray our civic missions, incite violence against our so-called enemies, and in general, do the work of the devil. The thing about these two narratives about speech is that they are both true, which is why we have two contrasting attitudes toward the production of speech enshrined in our laws. From the very beginning to this day, freedom of speech has been a double-edged concept, at once promising liberation and also delivering suffering in the form of humiliations, slanders, and even holocausts. Without free speech, it is said, life is cramped and claustrophobic. But it is also said that with free speech, deceptions small and large, and even tyranny are just always around the corner. Now, the double-edged status of free speech is reflected in First Amendment law, which alternately labors to increase the amount of free speech available to citizens, but also to constrain some forms of speech, like pornography or hate speech, when it is thought that they marginalize and impugn the dignity of those same citizens. Free speech purists, essentially libertarians, will resist any constraints on speech, even when there is evidence that the effects of speech are pernicious rather than beneficial. These purists will say that the inconveniences and even harms produced by 
free speech are a small price to pay for the good effects of allowing speech to flourish. These purists will then point to the marketplace of ideas as a location or forum in which speech of all kinds is voiced, but the separating of the good from the bad speech is left to time and to the impersonal judgment of the market. I absolutely hate the marketplace of ideas uh, metaphor. It is silly. It doesn't bear up uh, on the slightest uh, examination. And besides, although I've asked many times, no one has ever been able to direct me to the marketplace of ideas. <laughs> but let's put that by for a moment. And let me focus on, on, on the very notion of a free speech regime that is without constraint. This is, of course, the standard story of free speech, a story that assumes that speaking freely is the natural or default condition, while limits on speech are artificial, politic, political, and suspect. In this story, the Ur or basic model of speech is the Hyde Park Corner a place dedicated to the production of speech that is insulated from both seriousness and consequences. People get up on a soapbox or stand on a street corner and have their say about anything, subject to no constraint except perhaps the constraint of time, for after all, everyone should have a turn at having his or her say. In fact, however, that standard story has it backwards. Hyde Park corners and other free speech zones are not the central or basic condition of speech. They are derivative. And what they are derivative from are all those contexts in which speech is being produced because something is at stake. When speech is uttered within an understanding of the concerns it might be addressing, the structure of those concerns serves as a constraint, a prior constraint, determining silently without any fuss, which assertions are relevant and which irrelevant, or frivolous, or out of bounds, or even illegal. That constraint, the mocking out in advance of the acceptable and unacceptable, is not added to or imposed on the scene of expression. It gives the scene of expression its shape and tells those who participate it what they can and cannot or should not say. As long as there's something at stake, as long as speech is more than noise indifferently produced, there is no such thing as free speech. If this sounds counterintuitive, try to think, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, let me, no. free speech then, at least in my argument, is the outlier case. Constrained speech is the norm. Limitations on speech are part and parcel of any context in which speech is produced for a reason and not just for amusement. And that means that censorship in the form of it goes without saying restrictions on expression, censorship is built into ordinary occasions of speech production. It might seem odd to say so, but censorship precedes free speech. Censorship comes before free speech. If there were no censorship in the form of institutional purposes and goals that mock out what is appropriate and inappropriate to say, there would be no speech that was meaningful. You just have a lot of babble, which is what all of those apostles of the internet uh, with their silly slogans like information wants to be free, uh, finally a desire. Speech that is so democratic that none of it means anything to anyone. Now, if all of this sounds counterintuitive, try to think of a situation in which you can say anything that comes into your pretty little head. It's not that easy. Used to be the case that fans at a football stadium or baseball game could speak or shout freely, but recently those fans have been ushered out of the stadium when what they were saying was deemed to fall into the category of fighting words. And of course, an employer has every right to fire you if he judges your speech or your clothing to be disruptive of the workplace, or if he doesn't want his business to be associated with people who express your kind of views. You don't even have to espouse those views in the office in order to be shown the door. Some of those who marched on the alt-right side in Charlottesville were terminated when their employers learned what they had been up to. 
They, of course, had the right to demonstrate and to carry placards and to shout, Jews will not replace us. But that right did not protect them from being penalized when they exercised it. And you all know the case of the Google employee who was let go after he sent out an internal memo criticizing the company's diversity differences and suggesting that gender imbalance in the workplace, workplace might well be explained by natural differences between men and women. I guess he didn't get the memo issued by history announcing that this opinion is no longer one you're supposed to have. Freedom of speech is a right we have against government's efforts to suppress it, not a right to speak freely on any occasion. Many would say, however, that the case is quite different if the venue is not a commercial enterprise or a large corporation like Google, but a college or a university. After all, isn't the flourishing and protecting of free speech the very purpose of a university? The answer is no has nothing to do with the university. The answer is no, although many would answer yes. And among them, student protesters at Florida International University, who in a conversation with the university's president, complained that the university had established a free speech zone and did not recognize, as perhaps Greg would want them to recognize, that the entire university is, or should be, a free speech zone. Now, the students might be pardoned for thinking so, given that in 2016, a committee of the University of Minnesota's Faculty Senate issued a statement, issued a statement entitled Free Speech at the University of Minnesota. Here are some of the key statements made by that committee. A public university, all of these statements are false. A public university must be absolutely committed to protecting free speech, both for constitutional and academic reasons. Two, no member of the university community has the right to prevent expression. And three, even when protecting free speech conflicts with other important university values, free speech must be paramount, must be paramount. All of that is arrant nonsense. Let's take the last one first. That is, even when protecting free speech conflicts with other university values, free speech must be paramount. Now, if this were so, then the instructor who cuts off a student in mid-sentence and says, quote, that's not an argument we'll pursue here, uh, is defaulting on his proper academic duties. By the same reasoning, the Minnesota reasoning, the department that mandates a particular set of texts as the one to be studied in a core course and disallows departures from that official list is violating the academic rights of an instructor who would prefer another list or prefer no list at all. And by the same reasoning, a department that rejected a faculty member's proposal for a new course on the grounds that it did not fit with the department's priorities would be stifling that faculty member's free speech. Not to mention the department that refused to hire or promote a candidate because his or her views were deemed insubstantial or below our standards. Surely, according to the University of Minnesota's Senate Committee, this would be an impermissible silencing of an alternative voice. Now, of course, all of these examples are obviously absurd and intended to be so. For singly and together, they amount to a misunderstanding of what goes on in a university, which is not the proliferation of voices uh, by some resonant and self-gratulatory democratic principle. What goes on in the university is the continual judgment by persons and bodies authorized to judge that some voices are worthy to be heard while others are to be sent away and silenced. Far from being the case, as the Minnesota statement says, that no member of the university community has the right to prevent expression, it is the very job of many members of university communities to prevent expression to tell some people, among them students and faculty, you're not going to be allowed to speak, go away. It cannot be the case that a public university is, quote, absolutely committed to protecting free speech, unquote. What the university, Minnesota or any other, is absolutely committed to is the advance of knowledge through an inquiry into the truth of a matter whether that matter be literary, philosophical, historical, sociological, anthropological, and so forth and so on. The university 
This one or any other is not in the business of protecting speech, but in the business of excluding speech, its procedures judge unworthy. So that the basic distinction is a distinction between freedom of speech on the one hand and freedom of inquiry on the other. They are not the same thing. In fact, in many ways, they, they are opposed. When the protesting students at FAU met with the president, they declared that only a university which was one large free speech zone is, quote, conducive to democracy. That might be right if the university were a democracy, but it isn't. So I don't see even the point of the statement. It is true, as the FIU students went on to say, that as citizens of the US, we need not apply for a permit to speak. The First Amendment should be our only permit because we are all equal people. Yes, they were and are, if the criterion for speaking is citizenship. For it is a cornerstone of our democratic principles that citizens, no matter what their economic or educational status or political affiliations or religious commitments, have an equal right to speak out on matters of public concern or even matters of private concern. But that cannot be the core principle of a university where the main obligation is to inquire into the present state of our knowledge in a field and then to supplement or challenge that state in the hope of arriving at a better and more accurate account of the subject of hand. Obviously, there is nothing democratic about the course of this inquiry. It is, in fact, better described as Darwinian, the survival, if not of the fittest, at least the survival of those who are still standing after all the votes have been taken and the, all the evidence has stood the test of rigorous examination or failed to do so. The conclusion is one that I have already anticipated uh, and is, in fact, the title of this little piece, Freedom of Speech is Not an Academic Value. And I would add to that, there are no free speech issues on campus, which is <laughs> gonna to sound to you absolutely nuts, but let's see. All right, completeness, so freedom of speech is not an academic value. Completeness of speech is an academic value. You shouldn't leave out evidence that counts against your case. Relevance of speech is an academic value. You shouldn't go off on tangents either in the classroom or in your scholarship. Each of these values is directly related to academic inquiry and to its goal of getting a matter of fact right. Now, of course, in the current scene, as Greg has pointed out, debates about free speech occur in the context not of classroom activities or even scholarly production, but in the context of extracurricular activities. Extra, as you all know, means outside of, or not integral to, or detached from. Extra also means that the activities that fall under that rubric are not essential to the university's mission and could be dispensed with. A college or university that just had students, faculty, a library, laboratories, and a computing center would be a university. Even if there were no student union, no food court, no athletic events, no auditoriums for visiting speakers, no bowling alley, no gymnasium with a swimming pool, and no climbing walls. If, however, the things that I have just listed were present in a space, but students, faculty members, and libraries were not, what you would have is not a university or a college, but a playground or at most a theme park. So colleges and universities are not under any obligation to include all these extras, although political and economic realities pretty much dictate that they must have some of them in order to attract a su sufficient number of students. I taught for 11 years at a college, university, Johns Hopkins University, that had none of them, and it was the best place uh, that I've ever seen. But here's where the trouble begins. How does a university administration determine what events shall be authorized and what events shall be turned away if it decides to allow the extracurricular circus to come to town? And if an event has been authorized by the proper administrative procedures, how then does that same administration deal with the possibility of disruption and even violence? These questions, asked by every administration these days, sound as if they were deep questions, that is, related to significant moral and philosophical issues. They are not. They are merely questions of crowd control. 
Remember, the university is not presiding over extracurricular occasions in the same way as it presides over its classroom or its laboratories. The university may believe that the, these uses, these extracurricular uses, enhance the undergraduate experience or provide uh, interesting perspectives. But of course, that will be so only in a limited number of cases. Rock band concerts and visiting provocateurs are in the entertainment, not in the education business. In fact, in my mind, all extracurricular activities fall into the category of entertainment. And once that is understood, uh, uh, and once that is understood, let me see, oh yeah, the obligation of the administration uh, comes, uh, comes into focus. The obligation is to invite those in who are in fact likely to entertain, including entertaining in the mode of provocation. But you should take care that the entertainment doesn't get out of hand and lead to the destruction of the very facilities that will welcome another form of entertainment next week. The show must go on, okay? So that, that, that's, 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 that's the whole thing. What you want is an experience that is stimulating, but not too stimulating. Voices and hands may be raised, but no blows landed. No one should be bored, and everyone should leave thinking, I had a really good time. The problem is that in the current campus atmosphere, assuring that happy outcome can cost a fortune. UC Berkeley spent over $600,000, it is reported, to, in an effort to keep the peace during a lecture given by one speaker. Is a university required to risk bankruptcy in order to avoid being found guilty of what is called in the law viewpoint discrimination? Now Robert Post, former dean of the Yale Law School, would say that that is the wrong question. The right one, he explains is, does this event or speaker contribute to the university's mission of research and education? That's his question. This means, he explains, that speakers should be invited only because they serve these missions. And when they do not, failing to invite them or revoking an invitation too hastily tendered should raise no First Amendment issues because educational, not First Amendment values should be paramount. So in both cases, and in the classroom, in the laboratory, there are no free speech issues. In extracurricular activities, there are no free speech issues. Post neatly sidesteps the charge of viewpoint discrimination because what he is discriminating against is not a point of view as such, but a point of view that does not mesh with the purposes of the institution. Non-meshing is a judgment that might be applied to speech on any side of the political cultural divide the point is not what the speech says, but whether what it says is helpful to the educational process as it has been judged to be so or not so by the administration. Therefore, administrators needn't tie themselves in knots over First Amendment issues. They should just forget about the friggin' First Amendment. They should just remember the mission of the institution they preside over and say yes or no to speakers without any free speech anxiety. And that will be debatable. Here's my little list. Richard Spencer, no. Charles Murray, yes. <laughs> David Duke, no. Betsy DeVos, absolutely. Donald Trump, a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> so administrators facing disruptions over extracurricular events can, I think, do one of three things. One, don't have any extracurricular events. <laughs> Two. If you decide to have them, make sure that you have a crowd control plan in place and the resources to implement. Or three, invoke Robert Post's test question, does it further the university's mission? And just say no to those events that are likely to be more theatrical than educational. Final point, if I can turn the page. I have ignored so far what might be considered the most pressing question to which Greg spoke. Why is it that student pro protests now take the form of hooting down speakers whose views they reject, sometimes hurling objects at them and refusing to engage with them at all? The answer is that rather than conceiving of themselves as participants in the university's core activity, separating the true from the false, many of today's students' protesters are persuaded that they already know what is true and what is false, and therefore believe that they are under no obligation whatsoever to listen to views they have already labeled as beyond their pale. The partnership 
The, uh, the partnership of faculty and students in the search for knowledge has been abandoned by these students in favor of a righteousness that is finally more subversive of the academic spirit than the external constituencies that have traditionally attempted to subvert it. Once one understands, once one understands student protests as the expression of a theology rooted in the conviction of virtue, and therefore in the conviction that there is nothing really to learn, key terms and slogans begin to make a distressing sense. I refer, of course, to safe spaces, microaggressions, cultural appropriations, uh, trigger warnings, no platforming, et cetera. What is it students wish to be safe from? Ideas and perspectives that run counter what to, the, to what they already believe. In short, they don't want to learn. What is a trigger warning? A warning by an instructor to students that they may not like what they're about to hear or read, and therefore have the right to avoid it by not reading or not listening. They want to learn. In other words, they don't want to learn. What is a microaggression? Mistakes wholly unavoidable made by those who speak from a culture, from one culture to others who inhabit another culture. Because they are unavoidable, microaggressions amount to a game of gotcha. For there will always be something to say, you say, that offends someone, and according to the logic of virtue, you deserve to be condemned for saying it. You're just not pure enough. Okay? Now, the instructor might, who, who resolves to avoid microaggression uh, entirely had best just keep his or, mouth, his or her mouth shut and say nothing, or say only what is expected which is what the virtue besotted students really want. And as for cultural appropriation, the idea that a culture owns a form of music or a mode of dress or a style of cooking is racism pure and simple. Racism for it makes sense only if those modes and styles have their source in blood. And by this reasoning, arguing that some arguing that certain forms of ethnic music shouldn't be performed by white persons is the same as arguing that certain uh, ethnic populations lack intelligence. They're exactly the same, exactly the same arguments. Uh, if, in fact, if, 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 in fact, these modes and styles of performance have their source in a culture, as they surely do, then anyone who takes the time to enter and become a member of that culture has as much right to the clothing or music or food as anyone else. Steve Martin had a wonderful movie on this topic called The Jerk many years ago. OK, last sentence. Oh, all right. This stuff, all of it, microaggressions, trigger warnings, cultural appropriations, safe spaces, just shouldn't be taken seriously. And the fact that it is is unhappy evidence that university administrators have lost sight of what their mission truly is. For were administrators to keep their eye on that mission, they would receive requests for trigger warnings and safe spaces and complaints against microaggressions and cultural appropriations with patience and then send the protesters away with a smile and with good wishes and with nothing else. Thank you. <laughs>